What is the purpose to life? Why are we here? Where did we come from? For that matter, where are we going to go when this life is over? Hmm. In this seminar, it talks about the age of the earth. Dr. Hoven gives solid evidence to show that this earth is not billions of years old. In fact, the evidence points towards a literal six-day creation, like told about in Genesis chapter 1. Hi, my name is Aaron, and we hope you enjoy this incredibly powerful seminar presented by Dr. Hoven. It's called The Age of the Earth. to be here in Southern California tonight. How many have been to one of my seminars before or seen a videotape? How many never have? Okay, and how many do not understand the question so far? <laughs> Good guy. My name is Ken Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years. And now I travel and do seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I let people know what I believe before I get started. I believe the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. I believe it from cover to cover. <clears throat> Amen. And I believe the evolution theory that's being taught in our schools is one of the dumbest and most dangerous religions in the history of humanity. <laughs> and those are the nice things to say about it. Okay. So, uh, one of my jobs as a Christian, and your job if you're a Christian, is to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that's in us. And I think in the last 200 years, the Christians have not done a good job of answering the skeptics. And we've allowed them to take over our school system and our legal process, and our whole thinking process is now based on this theory called evolution. Folks, there's a war going on, and there are three things I try to accomplish in my seminar. Number one, I want to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Number two, if you're not saved, I'm going to try to get you converted tonight. Okay? I told you right up front, I'm after you. All right? <laughs> Number three, if you're saved and you're not doing much for the Lord, then I'm going to try to make you uncomfortable. Fair enough. I need to warn you, just about every sin in the book is mentioned in my seminar series. It's likely that everybody's toes will be stepped on at least once. We recommend steel-toed shoes or a willingness to move your feet. <laughs> you will need one or the other. Okay, this, this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. We live in Pensacola, Florida. Been there for 15 years. I have three kids, one of each. My kids are 24, 25, and 26, a year and two weeks apart. It's called family planning where I come from. And let's see, my daughter Marlissa is here tonight. Where'd she go? Marlissa? She's out there somewhere. They got the stuff at the airport. I saw them here. And uh, anyway, I got them all married off, brother, and the dog died, so I made it. I'm home free. It's wonderful. And all six of them work for me in my ministry, and now I've got two grandkids, and hopefully a thousand more coming. Grandkids are God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. <laughs> we, uh, at our ministry, produce a lot of videotapes. We've made over a million videos now in six languages. They're not copyrighted. We encourage you to get our stuff and spread it around. It's copied all you want. We put out a lot of materials, and we want to see people get saved. We have quite an interesting ministry. I'll tell you more about that in a minute there in creation science evangelism. Uh, we have about 40 people on staff now, a little over 40, and we are trying to stir up trouble for the entire planet. Okay. Now, we do this because we want to change people's worldview. A worldview is the way you view the world, obviously. Now, there are two ways to view this world. Some people look at the world and say, you know, it's amazing that this came from evolution. Other people say it came from a creator. Now, the way you answer the four great questions in life is determined by how you view the world. The four fundamental questions of life, who am I, where did I come from, why am I here, and where am I going when I die, those four questions are answered very differently depending on how you view the world. Some people look at the world and say, it's amazing, a big bang made this from nothing. That's the humanist worldview based on evolution. Other people look at the world and say, you know, there's incredible design, there must be a designer, and that's called the creationist worldview. And those two worldviews are polar opposite. I mean, somebody's wrong, okay? And they are at war with each other. <clears throat> and I enjoy showing them who's wrong. So that's what I do. I go around and do a lot of debates at universities. I've had 87 now, debates at universities. I had three in the last uh, two weeks. Can't find any more opponents, though. So if you believe in evolution, you want to debate on the topic, call me. I'll be glad to come do it, okay? Now, if the evolution theory is true, how would you answer the four fundamental questions of life? Who am I and what am I worth? 
Well, if evolution is true, you are nothing important. You're just a bit of protoplasm that washed up on the beach. You're not worth a thing. Actually, you're part of the problem because you're one of the polluters of the environment. And the more of you we can get rid of, the better. Where did I come from? Now, if evolution is true, we came from a cosmic burp about 20 billion years ago. Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Well, if evolution is true, there is no purpose, so you might as well have fun. If it feels good, do it. Where am I going when I die? Well, if evolution is true, we're going to the grave and we're going to get recycled into a worm or a plant. But see, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if that's true, that puts a whole different set of answers to those questions. That means we better try to figure out who God is and find out what He wants and do what He says. Because He owns this place, folks. He makes the rules. It belongs to Him. But the devil doesn't like that. The devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. The first sentence out of the devil's mouth was a question to make Eve doubt God's word. And he's still doing the same thing today. He wants you to doubt God's word. I think that's one of the reasons why there's so much confusion about all the different Bible versions. Oh, where is God's word? Same old trick from the devil. Second thing he said to the woman, he said, ye shall not surely die. Now he's denying God's word, and he does that still today. But the third thing he said is what I want to talk to you about tonight. He said, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. And right there is where the whole idea of evolution got started. It didn't start with Charlie Darwin. It started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. He wants you to think you can become a god. Yes, boys and girls, we started off like an amoeba, and we're evolving. We're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter, and someday we're going to sail around the universe and discover new life forms like Star Trek. People ask me all the time, they say, Hoven, do you think there's intelligent life on other planets? I say, no. Nope. I taught high school 15 years. There's not much intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> Satan's a liar. He said, you can be like God. Well, I tell you what, the Mormon church has swallowed that one, haven't they? They teach their people, if you're a good Mormon, you get to be God someday. And if you're a good Mormon wife, when you go to heaven, you get to be eternally pregnant, producing spirit babies. My wife don't want to go. <laughs> she said, that's not heaven, honey. <laughs> By the way, there are some great books to reach Mormons, and they need the gospel just like everybody else. There's a good website, UTLM, for utahlighthousemission.org, if you have everything you want to know about Mormons. I was surprised to find out a couple years ago, some of the major Catholic theologians of the past have taught man can become God. Now, most Catholics don't believe that. They don't even know some of their leaders have taught that. The idea that man can be God came from the devil in the Garden of Eden. He's the one who wants to be God. Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. <clears throat> I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See, the devil wants to be God. But the job is not available. So <clears throat> he's all upset about that, and he can't be God. So he's mad at God, but he can't do anything to God, so he's mad at us because we are made in God's image. Did you ever wonder why the devil hates you so bad? It's because you remind him of God. So he lied to Eve and told her she could be like God. Now Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. He said they're more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. Now, if you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you have to do it like my two big brothers did with me. I have two older brothers. They've always been older than I am. <clears throat> but when I was about six years old, I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois, and I came running in for breakfast one morning, and I was the first one there for breakfast. And I got the last banana out of the bowl to put on my cereal. Well, a few minutes later, my two big brothers came in, and they said, hey, Kent, is that the last banana? I said, yep, and I got it. How many of you have an older brother or sister? You know that wonderful feeling you get when you finally pull one over on them? They pick on you all the time. Boy, that morning I had them and I knew it. They wanted my banana. But big brothers do not beg little brothers for anything. They either beat them up and take it away by brute force, or they lie to them and trick them out of it somehow. So my brothers said, hey, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. I was only six years old. It's been proven in laboratory tests the brain doesn't even start to grow till kids are 18 to 20. <laughs> How many parents can verify that one from raising kids? <laughs> I said, 
I said, no, how are bananas made? And they said, well, down in South America, they have these spiders that live up in the trees. And when they die, all their legs fold up. And then mold begins to grow on the dead spider legs. And a banana is nothing but moldy spider legs. I said, you guys are lying to me. You just want this banana because you know it's the last one. They said, no, brother, we're not lying. You cut that thing in half and look in the middle. You can still see the black spots where his legs were. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I did not eat bananas for nearly three years after that. <laughs> they lied to me. <clears throat> have you ever been lied to before? You know, I would not have believed a lie if it hadn't been for those black spots. You see, if you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you have to mix it in with some truth. That's a technique they've used for years to kill rats. They mix two things together. They really don't belong together. They have mixed together in that box good food and rat poison. Actually, a lot of folks don't realize, but rat poison is 99.995% good food. <laughs> There's very little poison in rat poison. But by mixing them together, the rat thinks he's getting free food. Well, yes, but he's getting poisoned. It's the same technique they use to sell Marlboro cigarettes. For years, they've been mixing them in with cowboys. Watch any Marlboro commercial. There's something about a cowboy in there someplace, right? Have you ever thought about that? What is the connection between smoking Marlboro and cowboys? Do all cowboys smoke Marlboro? No. Do you have to smoke Marlboro to be a cowboy? No. If you start smoking Marlboro, do you become a cowboy automatically? Uh, no. You may smell like a horse, but you are not a cowboy. Okay? Actually, it's been proven in laboratory tests that nobody in the world smokes. Nobody smokes. Only the cigarette smokes. The person is the sucker. That's all. <laughs> I think they ought to put the real name on those things. They ought to call them cancerettes, breath rotters, bypass, malignant, phlegm balls, and money suckers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> they do the same thing with beer, though. They always try to associate beer with sports. What does beer have to do with sports? They get some big old football player holding his can of Bud Dumber. Or Bud Stupid. <laughs> they call it Bud Wiser. It don't make him any wiser, that's for sure. He's got his Bud Dumber, Miller Low Life, or Dead Dog. But he says, man, you drink this stuff, you'll be a football player. Yeah, right. Bible says, you drink that stuff, you will wreck your life. Who hath woe? They that tarry long at the wine. The Bible says, don't even look at it when it gets fermented. Habakkuk said, woe to him who giveth his neighbor drink. The Bible has a lot to say about this topic. One kid said, what's the matter, Brother Hovind? Don't you like beer? I said, I don't know. I've never tasted it. I'm 51 years old, never had a drop in my life. Well, I had NyQuil a couple times. <laughs> and he said, uh, <clears throat> how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? I said, son, that's a brilliant way to live. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever laid your head under a semi-truck? <clears throat> <laughs> how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? <laughs> okay. You don't have to try everything to figure out if it's good or bad. Okay, There's other ways to learn. But this mixing of the good and the bad together is exactly what's going on in our science books. Now, folks, I'm not against science. I like science. Matter of fact, we have a science center and dinosaur adventure land, my backyard, five and a half acres of the coolest place on planet Earth, right next to Pensacola Christian Academy, right behind where they produce the Becca books. Some of the kids are telling me they use the Becca books. That's where we're right behind them. We've had 30,000 visitors in the first two and a half years. Everything has a science lesson and a spiritual lesson. We have just some amazing things going on there. We can try our climbing wall or see our seven-foot snake. He ate a kid last week, but uh, oh well. Uh, we have bacteria model and all kinds of dozens of skins and skulls of animals. If you have any of those things, send them. We'll put them on display. One of our guys shot a T-Rex. We hung it on the front of the building. Um, we like science. We're not against science. Everything has all these cool science lessons. We have a seven-level seven cave crawler. You can try to crawl in there. And uh, try to, some kids are still in there from a week ago. We can't find them. Um, our leap of faith swing off the 16-foot tower. Uh, parents say, isn't that dangerous? We say, well, yeah, but there's a lot of kids, and they're always making more. So, uh, <laughs> You can measure your horsepower if you think you're in pretty good shape. Come on out and see how many horsepower you are. We have all kinds of cool dinosaur stuff every place around. Well, dinosaur adventure land. What do you expect? You know, uh, We've had people from all over. God's given us an amazing staff. We like science, folks. We're not against science. We dig for fossils, and different people support our ministry from time to time. And we have all kinds of homeschool classes on uh, video uh, or DVD. If you want our homeschool classes, teaching all science, kinds of things. Okay, we do all this. We even have a creation boot camp coming up. Every September, we have a boot camp. If you want to come get booted, or whatever they do at boot camp, uh, September we teach you how to be a better creation scientist and how to get out and speak on creation. We're going to train some more leaders there this September. We're not against science. We even teach the kids the scientific way to shoot a rubber band. 
I need two volunteers here, a boy and a girl. There's a boy right there and a girl right there. Come on up here. Let's go. Come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Daylight's burning. Let's go. Okay, now what's your name? Ashley. Ashley? Is this your husband here? No. What's your name? Stephen. Stephen? Pick out a rubber band. The red one and the yellow one. So I'll get a blue one so it's, we can tell who's shooting the different ones, okay? They're all the same, though. Okay, ladies first. Ashley, see how far you can shoot it out there toward the back? Now, you want to let go of the end that's closest to you. Oh, that's not blonde. That's not blonde. Never mind. Okay, go ahead. Oh, about six rows back. Okay, Stephen? Where'd his land? About the same place. Now, I happen to know the scientific way to shoot a rubber band. Are you ready for this? You see the guys in the sound booth back there? Hey, did it make it into the sound booth back there? Oh, right, hit the wall right in front of it. Okay. Now, right about now, you're thinking of a question that has five words in it. See? See? <laughs> How did you do that? Okay. Now, first of all, I need to let you know that I am fully aware of the fact that some kids should not learn how to do some things. <laughs> who's, who's responsible for this one here? Is she safe with this information? Okay. Now, this one I'm really worried about just from looking at him. Who's responsible for this guy right here? Is he safe with this information? Not. Oh, what does she know that I don't know? <laughs> okay, now I want you to notice my fingers do not leave my hand at any time when I do this, okay? That's important, okay? There are two sides to the rubber band. You with me so far? Yeah. Okay. One side represents your flesh, that's your body. The other side is your spirit. Now, your flesh and your spirit have to work together or else you're dead. See, if your spirit ever leaves your flesh, you've got a real problem on your hands. Actually, the neighbors do. <laughs> but, okay. Now, here's what most people do wrong with rubber band shooting and in real life. They put the same emphasis on the flesh and the spirit. And when they let it fly through the air, if you could watch it in slow motion, the flesh and the spirit are fighting with each other all the way. So all the energy is wasted on internal turbulence within the rubber band. It doesn't go very far. So the secret to high-speed velocity through a fluid medium, such as the atmosphere, which offers resistance, is to minimize or eliminate the turbulence. <laughs> if you want it to go farther... You put more emphasis on the spirit and less on the flesh. I'm going to stretch this side tighter. Feel it. One side's tight, one side's loose. So if you let it go quickly, it'll spin through the air. The spirit leads the flesh. Less turbulence, greater distance. So if you really want to go far for the Lord, quit putting so much emphasis on the flesh. It's real simple. Now watch this carefully. Those people coming in late, we're going to nail them. <laughs> Almost got it. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you, thank you. Have a seat. <laughs> That's just one of about 80 science lessons we teach the kids at Dinosaur Adventureland, along with a good spiritual lesson. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. They are contrary one to the other. We also teach the kids how to make a paper airplane that'll fly over 400 feet. Our record is 450 feet with a paper airplane. They go so far that if they don't land on a building or in a tree, they go all the way to the ground. <laughs> it's amazing, brother. You can go on our website, drdino.com, and see how to make those. Folks, we're not against science. We like science. But I'm against the poison mixed in our science books. That's what's bothering them. Here's a first grade textbook. Look what they tell the kids in first grade. Boys and girls, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. Now just hold on a minute. Is the Earth four and a half billion years old? No, but if you tell that to a first grader, he's going to believe you. First graders believe everything you tell them. They believe bananas are moldy spider legs. <laughs> I did, okay. And then tell them again in second grade. Since its formation four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. Down here it says, life too has evolved on Earth. 
This word evolved is a very tricky word. There are six different meanings to the word, okay? So I've learned, I've done 87 debates and over, I think, 7,000 now radio and TV call-in talk shows. I've learned how to win the debate on evolution in the first five minutes. It is so easy. If somebody says, do you believe in evolution? I simply say, what do you mean? Well, you, well, you know, evolution. Oh, no, I don't know. What do you mean? Which, what, which meaning are you talking about? Are you talking about cosmic evolution? That is the origin of time, space, and matter, the Big Bang? No, I don't believe in that. Are we talking about chemical evolution? Because according to the Big Bang theory, the Big Bang made hydrogen. Okay, then how did we get these other elements? Do you want me to believe that uranium evolved from hydrogen? They'll say, well, yeah, in stars, you get fusion. Well, you can't fuse past iron. Check it out. So how do we get uranium? Huh? You want me to believe in stellar and planetary evolution, that the stars and planets form? Nobody's ever seen a, a star form. We see stars blow up all the time. It's called a nova or a supernova if it's a big one, but we've never seen one form. And yet there's enough stars out there right now that we know about that everybody on planet Earth can individually, personally own 11 trillion of these stars to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. Then there'd have to be organic evolution. That's the origin of life. Nobody has a clue how life can get started from non-living material. Do you want me to believe that living things came from... you want me to believe in spontaneous generation proven wrong 200 years ago? No. I don't believe in any of those four. Maybe you're talking about macroevolution. That's where an animal changes into a different kind of animal. Nobody's ever seen that. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. I mean, you may get a big dog or a little dog, I understand, but you're going to get a dog, okay? Every time. And it could be the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. But I'll tell you what, every little kid knows they're the same kind of animal. I'll show you. Is anybody in here five or six years old? Who's five or six? How old are you? Six. What's your name? Hmm? Rachel. Rachel? Rachel, why don't you take a test here, Rachel? Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? The banana, very good. Let's give her a hand. All right. Amen. <laughs> we have college professors can't figure that one out. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. See, if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Simple definition. Can they bring forth? A dog and a wolf can mate and bring forth. A dog and a banana cannot. Now, see, Charlie Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of Species. And how the Christian church got lost in the 1800s and didn't catch that, I don't know. But they didn't catch what's happening. They're changing the definition. If they'd have stuck with the word kind, we never would have had this dumb evolution theory permeating our society. They bring forth, they're the same kind. Anyway, lastly, we have what's called microevolution. This is variations within the kinds. Ah, now this one happens. So if you want to talk about variations, I agree, they happen. That is actually science. The first five meanings of the word are purely religious. So I'm telling you, folks, if you're going to get into a discussion on evolution, you better define what you're talking about, or you'll never get any place. Because when I say the word evolution, I'm thinking of these five up here, but when the atheist says the word evolution, he's thinking of number six. And he doesn't understand how I can't see it, and I don't understand how he does see it, because we haven't defined the terms. That's the problem. Anyway, the teachers are told in their teacher's manuals, be sure to stress that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. You know, I happen to be a little old-fashioned. I think in science class we should be teaching science. You know, things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. Science. Things like the first law of thermodynamics, which tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. Well, everything's made out of matter, so if matter cannot be created or destroyed, then how did the world get here? We're here, you know. So that leaves two choices. Somebody made the world, or the world made itself. There's no other choice. Well, there are a few out there on the lunatic fringe who will tell you, we're not really here at all, we just think we're here. <laughs> okay, well, you can forget about those folks. We're here, <clears throat> okay? So either somebody made the world like the Bible says, God did it, or the world made itself like the humanists believe. Well, if the world just made itself, how could this happen? Oh, the devil thought about that for a long time. And finally, one day, he came up with the Big Bang Theory. How many have ever heard of the Big Bang Theory? 
I was on the airplane years ago flying from Dallas to San Francisco, the land of the fruits and the flakes. And I happened to sit right next to a professor from Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley. I don't know if you folks down here have ever heard of Berkeley or not, but Berkeley is not a Bible college. <laughs> I got to speak last year at Berkeley for 10 hours, the most hostile audience I've ever had in my life. It was so fun. <laughs> it was a blast, brother. I'm doing it again in April, two more months. Berkeley, yay, bring them on. 138 professors refused to debate me. So I'll just go straighten them out by myself. Okay. The guys are a lot smarter than I am, but I slaughter them because I'm right, they're wrong. Okay. <laughs> you know, would you want to defend the idea that we all came from a rock? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, I'm sitting on the airplane right next to this professor from Berkeley, and we started talking about creation and evolution. Everybody I sit by on the airplane wants to talk about that, so I talk about it with them. He said he, be he believed in evolution. I said, yes, sir, I figured that. You have to to teach at Berkeley. I said, tell me, sir, if you believe in evolution, how did the world get here? He said, oh, it came from the Big Bang. I said, really? I'd like to hear about this. He said, you're a science teacher and you've never heard of the Big Bang? I said, oh, yes, sir, I've heard a lot about the Big Bang. And I believe in the Big Bang, but my Big Bang's a lot different than yours. I said, you tell me about your Big Bang, and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. And so the professor went off on one of those answers that looked like it came straight from the textbook. He said, well, Hoven, I believe about 18 or 20 billion years ago, that's a long time, all the matter in the universe. Now, that's a lot of stuff. Hey, by the way, do you know the word universe comes from two Latin words? Uni, which means single, and verse means a spoken sentence. You know, we have verse and prose. Did you know we live in a single spoken sentence? God said, let there be. That'll preach, brother. There's a sermon right in there someplace, okay? And if you can't find it, you ain't got no preaching you at all, okay? <laughs> all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. What? Everything in the universe squished into a dot smaller than a period on a page. Wow. That's one crowded dot. <laughs> and heavy, too. <laughs> hey, boys and girls, it ain't the first time it happened, either. This textbook says, after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, no bigger than the period at the end of the sentence. Then another big bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. So you can forget about global warming. <laughs> We're going to get squished. <laughs> can you believe they cut down a tree to print that? <laughs> Where's Al Gore when you need him? Mm, that's what I want to know. <laughs> now, the guy that wrote this book was brilliant. I couldn't believe how smart this guy was. He said, boys and girls, nothing really means nothing. You have to be at least that smart to write a book. He said, not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. What? <laughs> yes, boys and girls, you see, one day, nothing exploded. <laughs> and here we are. Oh, well, that explains it, yeah. The Big Bang Theory started about uh, 1965, before, a little before that. They said the thing that exploded was a few light years in diameter. Then they said, oh, no, it's only uh, 275 million miles. Then they reduced it to 71 million miles. Then 54,000. Then they've made it a trillionth the diameter of a proton. Now that's tiny. Boy, we're talking tiny now. And now they say just nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's Discover Magazine a couple years ago. Where did everything come from? Boys and girls, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero. Nada. As it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? <laughs> ask, ask Alan Guth. His theory explains everything. Wow, i got to meet this Alan Guth guy. Well, Alan Guth said in Scientific American, the observable universe, that would be uh, us, could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. In the Greek, that's a dot. 
He said, it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Yes, boys and girls, you see, we all came from a dot, and the dot came from nothing. And they call that science and put it in a science book. I'd call that a fairy tale and put it in the garbage. I said, Professor, what happened to your dot? He said, well, Hoven, 20 billion years ago, all the dirt in the universe was drawn into this little bitty tiny dot, and it was spinning. It spun faster and faster, and one day, boom, it exploded, big bang. And the pieces that flew off became the galaxies and sun, moon, stars, and finally people. You know, here we are, nothing but stardust. I said, sir, can I ask you a few questions, please? He said, sure, what do you want to know? I said, well, you told me 20 billion years ago, all the dirt got together for the big squish and the big spin and the big bang. Where'd all this dirt come from? You know, who made matter? He said, we don't know about that. I said, okay, now hold it, sir. If I told you that I believe about 6,000 years ago God created the heaven and the earth, then you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I, and I don't know. But you said 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, and you don't know where the dirt came from. So basically, I believe in the beginning God, and you believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> don't tell me. No. Don't tell me my theory is religion and yours is science. They're both religion. But the news media tries to make it always look like it is science versus religion. They did a debate in El Paso, Texas, and they said, religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. What are they trying to imply just by the title? You see how they always try to make evolution part of science? No, evolution's a religion. Both creation and evolution are religious. I mean, you have to believe in either one. The difference is the evolution religion is tax-supported religion. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. By the way, these two timelines, it's the same information right here. The Bible teaches about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood, wrecked everything, dropped everybody's property value to zero. Two thousand years ago, Jesus came, and here we are today, waiting for the Lord to come back in about five minutes. Okay? This is the Bible view of history. On this chart, every inch is 150 years. That's a long time. If I was to show you what the 20 billion year chart would look like at the same scale as this one, this bottom chart would have to be 2,100 miles long. That's from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon. I don't want to carry a chart that big, so I made a new scale for this one, okay? The professor said he did not know where the matter came from. I said, well, sir, could you tell me where the laws came from? You know, the universe is run by laws. Gravity, centrifugal force, inertia, uh, Boyle's law, Cole's law. You eat that with potato salad? Uh, who made the laws, hmm? And by the way, why aren't the laws still evolving? Hmm? Why are the laws always so steady? The laws don't evolve. Gravity's consistent. Why don't you weigh more 10 pounds one day than you do... You say, I do. No, I'm not. Never mind. Uh, where did the energy come from? I mean, who bought the gas to run this machine? It takes energy to make something move. Where did the energy come from? The professor said, well, we don't know about that. I said, sir, could I ask you another question? He said, sure. What else would you like to know? <laughs> what else? What do you mean, else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, does Berkeley have a merry-go-round? How many of you know what a merry-go-round is? You go round, round, round till you puke, okay? He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round at Berkeley. I said, you ought to get one, man. You could learn some good science on a merry-go-round. If you put some fourth graders on a merry-go-round, any fourth graders in here? Who's in fourth grade? All right, I like fourth graders. I spent the best five years of my life in the fourth grade. That was before they diagnosed ADD. Oh. We're going to put some fourth graders on the merry-go-round, and we're going to get the high school football team out there to get it spinning clockwise as fast as it will possibly go. Now, if you have a digital watch, you may not know what clockwise means. Uh, we'll look, I'll tell you later, okay? We're going to spin the merry-go-round clockwise. The kids are going to go through four phases. They start off in phase one. They're screaming at the football players. Come on, let's go. Can't you go faster? Let's go. Move it, move it. You get up around 30 miles an hour. The kids enter phase two where they stop screaming. They just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on for dear life. <laughs> You get up around 60 miles an hour, and the kids enter phase three, where they start screaming again. But now they're screaming, stop, stop, please slow down. Don't stop, they'll keep going faster and faster. When you get to about 100 miles an hour, you should go into phase four. That's where the kids begin to fly off the merry-go-round. 
Now, when this happens, you will notice an interesting phenomena of physics. If the merry-go-round is spinning clockwise, when the kid flies off, the kid will be spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance, like a tree or a telephone pole. That's because of a law known as the conservation of angular momentum. You see, if a spinning object breaks apart in a frictionless environment, the fragments will always spin the same way because the outside's moving faster than the inside. People say, what if they hit each other? They can't hit each other. Drop a hand grenade off, let it explode. The longer you wait, the further apart the fragments become. How are they going to hit each other out there in the field someplace? Uh, duh. We could talk all night about the conservation of angular momentum, but the professor said, yes, I'm familiar with the conservation laws. I said, well, then good, sir. I have a question for you. If the universe began as a swirling dot, big bang, like you said, shouldn't everything be spinning the same way? He said, yes. I said, would you tell me why then that two and possibly three of the planets are spinning backwards? Can you tell me why eight of the 91 known moons are spinning backwards? Would you tell me why four planets have moons going both directions at the same time? Can you explain to me why some whole galaxies are spinning backwards? He said, that's interesting. <laughs> I said, no, sir, that's more than interesting. That's kind of hard on your Big Bang Theory. He said, why do you think they're going backwards? I was hoping he was going to ask that. I said, sir, it's very simple. You see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God did it that way on purpose, just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. Now, I do believe in the Big Bang, and I told him I believe in the Big Bang because the Bible teaches the Big Bang. It says, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The original Greek, that's a Big Bang. Mm -hmm. See? So there's going to be a Big Bang, but it didn't happen yet. So kids, if you go to school and some teacher says, do you believe in the Big Bang? You can say, yes, I do, and you better get saved and get ready for it. <laughs> the Big Bang is coming soon to a city near you. Mm -hmm. By the way, if the Big Bang Theory were true, the matter would be evenly distributed throughout the universe, and it's not. It's lumpy. They're called galaxies, and in bazillions of miles of nothing, called voids. That's why they're so desperate to come up with theories like black holes, dark matter, antimatter. They're looking for some way to salvage the Big Bang and it still explain the missing matter. Hmm. Even Fred Hoyle said, I have little hesitation saying a sickly pall now hangs over the Big Bang Theory. The theory's been dead for 20 years. They just don't want to bury it because they don't have a replacement. The only other thing they thought of is God did it. Oh, we don't want that. So let's hang on to the Big Bang Theory. Get the book The Evolution Cruncher if you want a whole lot more on that. Here, the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the word thermodynamics, thermo means heat and dynamics means power. So it's the power of heat. You, you can't just create things from nothing. And whenever there's an exchange of energy, there's something lost. The second law of thermodynamics tells us everything tends toward disorder. If you leave something alone for a while, it's going to rot, rust, die, fall apart, or break down. Nothing gets better by itself. That's what the Bible teaches. It says, the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish. They wax old as doth a garment. Nothing gets better by itself. Okay? Take a look at your hairdo when you wake up in the morning. You'll see what I'm talking about. Everything tends toward chaos. There is Sue at 20. Here she is at 90. <laughs> and here she is at 3,000. Mm -hmm. so, it's going to be you too, by the way, and me too. No. But the textbook says we're getting better. Humans probably evolved from bacteria more than 4 billion years ago. Was your great, 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 great grandpa bacteria? Now the evolutionists will say, Hoven, don't you know you can add energy and overcome the second law of thermodynamics? And they'll say, the sun adds energy to the earth, so that's how evolution works, because the earth receives extra energy. Well, it sounds good, but that doesn't, it's not true, okay? It's a deceitful argument. You see, the universe is a closed system by definition. Secondly, adding energy is destructive unless there's something to use the energy. Just adding energy doesn't solve it. Did you know the Japanese added a whole bunch of energy to Pearl Harbor one day? <laughs> they did not organize a thing for us, did they? A couple of years later, we returned the favor and added energy to some of their cities, didn't we? <laughs> didn't organize nothing. I'm telling you, folks, adding energy is destructive. See, the sun adds energy to your house, but it's going to destroy the roof on your house, not build it. The sun's energy will destroy your entire house. The sun's energy will destroy the roof on your car. It'll destroy the paint job on your car. It'll destroy the fabric in your 
drapes and your upholstery and your carpet. There's only one thing that can use the sun's energy, chlorophyll. And one little plant cell is more complex than a space shuttle. And you want to believe it evolved by chance, you just go ahead and enjoy yourself. I don't care what you believe, but that's not science. Now, this textbook shows the kids a fossil of a starfish. And it says, boys and girls, 3.4 billion years old, the remains of the early ancestors of modern human beings. Was your great, 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 grandpa a starfish? I bet he could pick peaches like crazy. All right, now please do not laugh at this next picture. This will be a picture of my brother when he first wakes up in the morning after his first cup of coffee, which apparently was a little too strong. By the way, kids, we need to warn you, listen carefully. Kids, pay attention. Do not drink coffee. Because if you drink coffee when you're young, when you get married, your babies will be born naked and illiterate. <laughs> and tea is worse. There was an Indian once that drank four gallons of iced tea. That night, he drowned in his teepee. <laughs> Serious stuff. Don't drink that. Anyway, this, this will be a picture of my brother. Now, please don't laugh. He can't help it. There he is right there. <laughs> Notice what the textbook says. 30 million years ago. Now, kids, let me translate that for you. Anytime a book says millions of years ago, what it really means is long ago and far away. It means a fairy tale is coming next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 30 million years ago, these critters evolved. Ooh, there's that word again. You've got to watch that one, remember? Six different meanings. It says they're ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Ancestors to humans? Grandpa? <laughs> what? What big eyes you have, Grandpa. <laughs> oh, the better to see you with, my boy. You know, we've been teaching our kids they're nothing but an animal, and today a lot of them act like animals. Barbara Reynolds figured it out. She's a liberal journalist. She said, your kids go ape in school? Here's why. He's being taught evolution. Guess what, Johnny? You're an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Uh, you mean I'm just an animal? <laughs> okay. <laughs> What do you expect? Have you noticed the rock and roll music these days is all full of death and destruction and blood? Well, the Bible says, they that hate me love death. That's the problem. Kids are taught today there are no absolutes. By the way, if evolution is true, that's exactly correct. I've asked this question to evolutionists all over the world. I've never had one answer, a simple question. I'll say, hey, sir or ma'am, I have a simple question for you. If evolution is true, how do we tell right from wrong? How does anybody tell right from wrong if evolution is true? They say there are no absolutes. One professor I debated said there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> Blew his little brain. Now, wait, 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 how can I be sure of that? Yeah. Yes, there are absolutes. Thus saith the Lord. That's absolute. And the Lord said, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. Some people, maybe, maybe they just don't know. Okay, I understand. Maybe they just don't care what God's Word says. But God told us what to do, and we're not doing it. Okay? Anyway, that's another long, interesting story. Um, teachers don't seem to understand. It's perfectly fine for you to teach creation science in a public school. If you're a public school teacher and you want to teach the kids about creation, just do it. You don't need to ask any questions. You don't need to get any permission. There's never been a law against teaching creation science. Now, two states pass laws to require creation be taught, Arkansas and Louisiana. In both cases, the court struck it down and said you cannot require that they teach creation. If you passed a law in California that said you are required to breathe, the court would strike it down. You're not, you can't require that they breathe. I mean, you probably should, okay? But they can't make you if you don't want to, all right? And so they can't require creation be taught. Even Stephen Gould said, no statute exists in any state to bar instruction in creation science. It could be taught before and it can be taught now. There's never been a law against teaching creation in the schools, never. We cover much more on that in video five. What's happened though, the ACLU, which is the American Communist Lawyers Union, 
they have, yeah. <clears throat> The ACLU has learned all they have to do is threaten to sue a school. They don't have to sue them. They threaten to sue, and the principal calls in the teachers and says, okay, guys, now listen. Don't teach creation because we might get sued. Now the teacher's got a problem. The court says they can. The law says they can. Their boss says they can't. And that's where it's breaking down, right there. But if a teacher does get up in front of their class and teach evolution, if you get up there and say, okay, kid, listen, you started off like a slime and you very slowly evolved to a human. You don't need to be a genius to figure out that teaching is going to destroy some kid's faith in the Bible. And anybody that destroys a child's faith better see what Jesus has to say about that. He said, whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus said, be not, or John, James said, Be not many masters, knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation. Back in the 1950s, here in America, there was very little evolution in the average textbook. Two to three thousand words in the whole textbook. They didn't talk about it much. Then in 1957, the Russians beat us in the space race by launching Sputnik, and Americans panicked. <clears throat> How many of you are old enough to remember the panic in America when the Russians were winning the space race? People were building bomb shelters. I mean, it was horrible, right? And somebody said, well, the Russians are ahead in science. That's why, you know, because they teach evolution. That's why they're beating us in the space race. Uh, excuse me. What does evolution have to do with putting up a satellite? Mm. Then in 1959, it was the 100-year anniversary of Charlie Darwin's book coming out. And in 1959, Eisenhower asked Congress for $1 billion to teach evolution to the kids in school. He said, we need to get a whole new science curriculum pushing evolution. One organization, the National Science Foundation, got $10,500,000, developed a nine-part theme curriculum teaching evolution. They produced a series called BSCS, Biological Sciences Curriculum Study. And by 1963, the, uh, yeah, I won't go off on that. Uh, <clears throat> the average textbook in America had 33,000 words about evolution. Uh, by 1963, prayer was taken out of our schools. Anybody remember that? Madeline Murray O'Hare. 1963 is when we saw a great rise in premarital sex for every single age group. Since 1963, we've seen a great rise in sexually transmitted diseases for kids 10 to 14 years of age. We've seen a great rise in unwed birth rates. That's a 100% increase in birth rates. There's been a 500% increase in pregnancies. The difference is being aborted. Cover that on video four. Right now, one third of all the kids born at the hospital are born to a couple that is not married. Illegitimate children. Now listen carefully. If you are one of those, God loves you and can use you in a powerful way. You know, Timothy never should have been born. The Greeks weren't the Jews weren't supposed to marry anybody outside the Jewish race. Timothy's mother married a Greek. Timothy's the result. He said, God, I want to serve you. God said, Okay, son, I'll take you. So if your parents messed up, you listen carefully. You shut your mouth and quit your whining and go serve God with your life. No excuses, okay? There's been a 725% increase in unmarried couples living together. God's word hasn't changed. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. He said, thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus said, if you even look in lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. By the way, ladies, that's why it's important how you dress, okay? My daddy always said, if you're not in business, don't advertise. <laughs> There's been an incredible rise in divorce rates until they finally just stopped getting married. And then divorce rates dropped off because why you can't get divorced because you're not, you're not married, right? The violent crimes have increased nearly 1,000% since 1963. Now, I'm not that old. But I remember the days when you did not have to lock your house. Anybody remember those days? And you left the keys in the ignition all the time. You never took them out because you might lose them. <laughs> and you go to the average high school, and half the pickup trucks in the parking lot had a loaded rifle hanging in the back window, and nobody got shot in school back in those days. You probably didn't hear about this, but the kids at Columbine that shot everybody were strong believers in evolution. They did the shooting on Hitler's birthday on purpose. 
They shot Isaiah just because he was black. Hitler hated black people. We covered that on video four. They shot uh, Rachel and Cassie just because they were Christian. And right after the shooting, Rosie O'Donnell got on her program and said, see, we need more gun control. Uh, Rosie, those kids broke 18 gun laws going into that school. Two more gun laws would not have slowed them down. See, Rosie can't figure it out. But one guy figured out the whole thing and put it on the tire cover on his van. I saw that. I said, I have got to get a picture of this. This explains it all. He said, blaming guns for Columbine is like blaming spoons for Rosie O'Donnell being fat. <laughs> not the spoon's fault, Rosie. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> SAT scores have plummeted since 1963. They finally had to dumb down the test in 95 to make the scores go back up to make the kids look smarter. Teen suicide rate has gone crazy. Now look, if I told you, <clears throat> if you kissed a frog, it would turn to a prince. You say, no, frogs don't turn to princes. How many of you ladies got your husband by kissing a frog? Come on now, let me see. Only two, okay. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often. But in the textbooks it does. Yes, boys and girls, we started like an amoeba. And we slowly evolved to a frog. There he is, Grandpa. And then very slowly evolved to a prince. It's the same, same fairy tale. Frog turns to prince. But see, instead of a kiss, no, they got a new magic ingredient. If the frog turns to the prince quickly, we all know it's a fairy tale. But if the frog turns to the prince slowly, that's modern science. It's the same fairy tale, folks, but they have a new magic ingredient. The new ingredient to turn the frog to a prince is billions and billions of years. How many have ever heard that expression before? Billions of years ago. It's on TV. It's on Carol Pagan's, Sagan's uh, show, Cosmos. Billions and billions of years ago. It's in the magazines. It's in National Pornographic. I'm geographic. You know. Billions and billions of years ago. Here's a fourth grade textbook. Millions of years ago. Now, kids, listen. If anybody ever says, millions of years ago, just say, uh, excuse me, were you there? <laughs> They'll say, well, no, of course I wasn't there. And you can say, now, teacher, do you know the earth is millions of years old? I mean, is this really part of science? Is this something we can observe and study and test and demonstrate in the laboratory? Or is this just something people believe? They're going to say, well, everybody believes the earth is millions of years old. <laughs> no, they don't. Most Americans think the earth is less than 10,000 years old and God made it. Only 4% are atheistic. I think that 4% ought to go start themselves a private school and teach evolution to anybody that wants to pay and come learn it. And they ought to get it out of our public schools. That's my unbiased opinion. Yeah. One textbook author said, this, the results of this and other similar surveys are startling because evolution has been a settled issue in science for 150 years. Maybe it's settled in his little brain. It is true that slightly more than half of the scientists believe in evolution. Those are the ones that have not been to my seminar yet. Okay. But even if a bunch of scientists believe in something, that doesn't make it true. There was a time when the scientists taught the planets go around the earth. There was a time when the scientists taught big rocks fall faster than little rocks. That was taught for 2,000 years, and it's not true. They fall the same speed. They used to teach, if you're sick, you have bad blood. Take out your blood, and you'll get better. That's how George Washington died. They had special places all over the country to get your blood taken out. You could tell where they were because they had a white pole with a red stripe around it. The barber was the blood letter. Still is today, sometimes. And right beside George Washington, when they bled him to death, was a Bible that told him the life of the flesh is in the blood. Man, if they'd have read that verse, he might still be alive today. <laughs> well, he'd live longer, okay? Now listen, if you went scuba diving and you found a treasure chest full of gold coins, and I asked you the simple question, when did the boat sink? And you say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Look at the dates on the coins. See, if there's a coin in there from 1750, you ought to be able to figure out the boat sank after 1750. 
How many can figure this out with no help? Okay. It couldn't sink before that, right? You don't go poking around in the box and find the oldest coin. You find the youngest coin, and that becomes what is called the limiting factor. The boat could not be older than that. Couldn't have sunk before that. There are all kinds of ways to limit the age of the earth to less than billions of years. Hmm. Now, if you find a dinosaur bone, like the one I've got in my museum, a dinosaur toe bone, you should notice two things about it immediately. Number one, it does not talk. Number two, it does not have a date stamped on it. It does not say, made by a dinosaur, 70 million B.C. in Taiwan. <laughs> it doesn't say that, okay? So how do you tell the age of a fossil? How would you tell the age of the earth? Go outside and get a shovel full of dirt and tell me how old it is. Well, the only way to tell for sure how old something is is to ask the guy who made it. Now, he knows for sure. And the Bible says God created the heaven and the earth. So I bet God knows how old it is. And the Bible tells us in Colossians that Jesus created heaven and earth. Well, guess what? That's one of many verses that proves Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. And Jesus said pretty clearly in Matthew chapter 19, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? By the way, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. You got to say that these days. But Jesus said that was the beginning. Same thing in Mark 10, 6. Well, now hold it. If that is the beginning, then we can figure out the age of the earth. Because the Bible says death came <clears throat> by sin. You know why we have death and suffering in the world today? It's because of Adam's sin. The Bible tells us clearly by man came death. In Adam all die. Man brought death into the world, according to Scripture. Now, according to evolution, death brought man into the world. Absolute opposite. And the Bible says Adam was the first man. It's real clear about the topic. And Eve was the mother of all living. So that makes it pretty simple. Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Seth was 105 when Enos was born. Enos was 90 when Canaan was born. If you go through the Bible and add up the dates, it's easy to do, folks. There's a couple of tricky spots in there. But you can go through the Bible and add up the dates, and you're going to get about 6,000 years for the total history of the world. You can get these charts. I've got one down here at the bottom of this, uh, hanging from the bottom. If you get my seminar notebook, the last page folds out to be this chart. We also have them laminated if you want them for placemats when your skeptic friends come for lunch. <laughs> you, can, you can really stir up a conversation with one of those things. <laughs> But anyway, if you add up the dates in the Bible, you get about 4,000 B.C. for the creation. Now, I don't try to put an exact date on it, okay? I don't say the creation was 4,004 B.C., October 23rd at 2 in the afternoon, okay? I don't think you can get that close. I think Adam was made in the afternoon because it's just before Eve. It's the only clue I found. <laughs> and I can't prove this, but I think I figured out why God made Adam first, I think God made Adam first because he didn't want any advice on how to do it. <laughs> I can see it now. No, God, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Shut up, Eve. I know what I'm doing, okay? <laughs> now, B.C. means before Christ. Just about every new textbook has changed it. They're calling it BCE. It means before the common era. You just check it out, folks. Christ is gone out of the schools. One guy said, why didn't God stop the shooting at Columbine High School? It's easy. God's not allowed in school anymore. <laughs> Don't blame him. <laughs> we got a problem here. Now, the textbook says the earth is billions of years old. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Hmm. Was Jesus lying? Did he not understand modern science, or was he right? How old is this earth, anyway? Well, we cover about 50 different ways to prove the earth is not billions of years old on the second half of videotape number one back there on the table. We don't have time to cover that tonight. But if the earth is only 6,000 years old, then what about dinosaurs? Where do they fit in? Well, it's real simple. Dinosaurs were big lizards with Adam and Eve. Noah took them on the ark. See, dinosaurs on the ark, they're kind of big, aren't they? Well, the big ones were big, but the little ones were little. 
And Noah was 600 years old when he went on that boat. I just bet he was smart enough to figure out you don't have to bring the biggest ones. Bring two babies. Mm -hmm. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. That'll be important later, okay? <laughs> There's all kinds of reasons for bringing babies on the ark, okay? Now listen, kids, we cover all that on video number three, all about dinosaurs. There could be some still alive today. Loch Ness Monster, Lake Champlain Monster, the one that washed up on the beach in California, 1925. All those pictures are on the website. But listen, kids, your textbook's going to tell you that you are an animal. Don't you believe that for one second? You are made in God's image. And you're going to stand before God one of these days and give an answer for everything you've ever said or thought or done or thought about doing. God keeps careful records. He's got it all. And if you want to get that record erased, there's only one way to do it. That's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, which cleanseth us from all iniquity. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> All right, let's uh, summarize here. God made the world. He owns it. He makes the rules. We are all guilty of breaking his rules. He told us pretty clearly, thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. These are the Ten Commandments. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life? Put your hand up. Come on, are you doing another one? Don't give me that pious look. Put your hand up there, brother. Okay. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. How many ever stole something? Come on, you already told me you're a liar. Put your hand up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so far we know we're all a bunch of lying thieves, right? Do you want to read the whole list and see how we're doing? <laughs> we, better, we better stop right there. There's no question we're guilty. The Bible says evil shall not dwell with thee. If you've committed one sin, you're guilty. You're going to hell. And some people think, well, God's going to weigh my good works against my bad works. Well, who on earth told you that? Why don't you go before the judge and say, Judge, I only murdered one person. Look at all the people I didn't murder. <laughs> you got to weigh my good against my bad. <laughs> Duh. He's not, not going to fall for that. And neither is God. We're guilty, folks, so we're going to be punished. Or we can find a substitute. Now, I can't substitute for your sins because I have a whole bunch of my own. Okay? And you can't substitute for mine because you have a bunch of your own, too. But Jesus Christ is not only willing, he's able. He's the only one who's able to substitute for your sins. I can't. You can't for mine. He's the only one who lived a sinless life. And praise God, he's willing also. Hey, if you died today, where would you go? I tell people, you really ought to think about that because you're going to be dead for a long time. George Washington died 205 years ago. And he is still dead. How much longer does he have to go? I don't care how long you live. You're going to be dead longer than that. Think about it. Think about it. You could die tonight. Have you seen the way they drive in Southern California? you got some rednecks moved out here, folks. I'm telling you what. You can get killed this evening. I'm going to die someday. I'm going to. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen. Okay? <laughs> it's going to happen to you too. Now, all you get in this life is a little bitty dash between two dates. That's it. Someday there's going to be a rock with your name on it. You know I'm telling you the truth. What are you doing with your dash? A little boy came to Jesus one day. He said, Jesus, you look like you're hungry. You've been preaching all day. Here, Jesus, you can have my sack lunch. I don't have much. only got five biscuits and two fish sticks, but you can have it. Jesus said, son, you mean I can have your whole lunch? He said, yeah, Jesus, go ahead. He said, well, son, have a seat right there. Watch this. 5,000 men plus women plus children, probably at least 20,000 people. Jesus said, okay, everybody sit down. They all sat down. He reached in that little boy's sack lunch and started making fish sandwiches and passed them all out fed everybody in the crowd, including that little boy. That's interesting. When they got done, they picked up 12 baskets full of leftovers and sent them home with that little boy. Here, son, take this home to Mama. Now, that little boy could have kept his lunch and fed himself. He decided to give it away, and he fed himself. And 20,000 more people, and got his name in the Bible. Not his name, but story. Now, 
I don't know what you're going to do with your life. You can do whatever you please with your life. I don't, I don't know what you're going to do. I'm leaving tomorrow morning. But listen, I would recommend you take your little life and say, Jesus, would you do something with this? Would you just do something? See, this is America, folks. You can work hard and make a lot of money and buy yourself a nice house, nice car, nice boat, have vacations. You really can live it up in this country. You really can. You can live your life for yourself if you want. That is your choice. Or you can live your life for the Lord, and then He will take care of what you need. It's amazing. I don't know what, what motivates you folks around here. I don't know. I, you just met me tonight. I just met you. But let me tell you what motivates me. 35 years ago, last week, I gave my heart to the Lord and got saved. I was a 16-year-old kid in high school, East Peoria, Illinois. I'd been saved for a couple of months. I was reading my Bible, going to church, growing, you know. And It was an independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist church I was going to. <laughs> they had, they had the, pul the preacher actually banged on the pulpit. I had never seen that before. I was raised in the Methodist church. We had two pulpits. One pulpit where they read the Bible from and another pulpit where he preached from. It took me a long time to figure out why. But it's because what he's reading over here is so far from what he's saying over here. <laughs> Had to separate them, you know. And I was growing in the Lord, reading my Bible, going to church, you know, and thinking, this is great, you know. And then one day a friend of mine said, hey, Kent, do you want to go with me to the Heart of Illinois Fair? I said, what's going on? He said, we got a booth set up for campus life, and we're witnessing to folks. I said, you're what? We're witnessing. We're telling them about how to get saved. I said, I've never told anybody how to get saved. I don't know how to do it. He said, well, come on, I'll just, show, I'll just give you one of the easy jobs. I said, okay. They had a couple of Volkswagen seats up there on the stage with wires in them. And people would sit down and they'd hit the button. And if you hit the button after the light turned green, you shock the other guy. But if you hit it too soon, you shock yourself. You know, bam, ooh, ah. And they're having contests who can shock the other guy, you know. And they use that to draw a crowd in there. Pretty cool idea. Anyway, <laughs> our job was to go out into the crowd and get them to fill out a questionnaire. Just ten simple questions. The last question said, would you like to get to know God better? And if they said yes, we were supposed to bring them to the back of the tent and introduce them to one of the people in the back of the tent who would lead them to Jesus Christ, a soul winner. I was having fun, man. First two days, I'm out there bringing people back. Hey, you want to get to know God better? Sure, come with me. Bring them to the back, open up the tent flap. George, this is Herman. He wants to get to know God better. Oh, Herman, come on in, and I'd go back and get me another one. It was fun. Third night, Heart of Illinois Fair. Noise every place. Kids on the stage getting, you know, shocked and everything. I went out, a big old football player there from Richwoods High School. I said, hey, would you fill out a questionnaire for me? He said, sure. He wrote the, you know, answered the questions. Last one, I said, would you like to get to know God better? He said, yes, I would. I said, all right, come with me. I'd done it before, nothing to it, you know. We walked back to the back of the tent, opened up the tent flap. There was nobody there. He said, what do we do now? I said, well, uh, I guess I'll show you. Keep in mind now, I'd never led anybody to the Lord in my life. This guy's twice my size. We went down, sat in the chairs, and, and the old metal chairs in the back of the tent in the heart of Illinois Fair. And I didn't know what to do, so I pulled a gospel track out of my pocket, God's Four Spiritual Laws. I said, let me read this to you. I sat there and read the whole thing. At the end, it says, would you like to receive Christ? He said, yes, I would. I thought, oh, brother, what do I do now? I got him on the hook, and I can't land him. <laughs> I said, well, it says pray this prayer. I said, let's close our eyes and bow our heads, and I'll pray first, and you repeat after me. He said, okay. I kept one eye open. I read the prayer off the track. I really did. <laughs> read the prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. He said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell, you know, but I believe you died for me, and I want you to forgive me and save me right now. We got done. He looked at me and shook my hand. He said, Kent, thank you. I've been worried about this for two weeks. I said, you're welcome. And he walked out. I'm noise every place. I mean, this is a carnival, you know. And here I'm standing in the, all by myself in the back of this tent. I thought, man, that was fun. Showing somebody how to go to heaven. I got down on my knees in the dirt next to that metal chair, and I said, Lord, uh, 
It's me, it's Kent, I'm a brand new Christian, and Lord, this is all confusing to me. I'll just tell you right now, I'm confused about a lot of things. I said, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do uh, with my life. I don't know. I said, but Lord, if it's okay with you, I, I think I'd like to do this the rest of my life. <laughs> I would just like to introduce people to you for the rest of my life. Well, it's been, uh, it's been 35 years. Nothing's changed. <laughs> I, I don't know what's important to you. Now, kids, you've got a thousand distractions in this world, I understand. I decided 35 years ago I'm going to give my dash to Jesus. See what, he, see what he can do with it. Some of you can give it to making money. You can give it to, you, you can give your dash to all sorts of things. I don't know what you're going to do with your life. That's a decision you've got to make. I'd recommend you do what I did, though. And it's never too late. You can be 85 years old and still give your dash to Jesus. And you say, Lord, I don't have much left, but you can have this. He can still feed 5,000 people. It's just a crumb. If all you got is a crumb left, he'll take it. If you're a Christian here tonight, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? There's a war going on. Can't you find something to do? <laughs> if you're not going to shoot, carry bullets. Take care of the wounded. Do something, okay? Everybody ought to start a ministry. The worst of you could serve as bad examples, if nothing else. <laughs> Find something to do with your life. Influence somebody for Jesus. Man, that's all I want to do. Well, we're over time tonight. We could talk all night about this, but if you want to use our materials, feel free. It's, they're not copyrighted. I told the Lord when I started this ministry 30, or 15 years ago, I said, Lord, there's a lot of things about your church I don't like. He said, son, I agree. I said, if you want me to go preach, I'm not going to copyright my stuff. I'm not going to charge anything for my seminars, and I'm not going to send out a letter every month begging for money. And if you don't supply, I'm going to quit, okay? <laughs> he won't let me quit. Preached 830 times last year. We got all kinds of videos on lots of different languages, Spanish, French, German. You can get, get one of our catalogs out there. We have all kinds of dinosaur fossil stuff you can use for witnessing tools and get our college courses. If you want to go down deep, stay down long, come up dry. <laughs> if we can help, that's what we're here for. Let's all stand, bow our heads, and let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you please raise up some soul winners out of this bunch? Lord, right within, within 10 miles of where we're standing, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people headed to hell Thousands of them. And Lord, we keep thinking the mission fields across the ocean someplace when it's right across the street. It's right next door. It's people we bump into at gas stations and toll booths and the grocery store and sit next to in school. And Lord, everybody here knows somebody that's going to hell. We're going to meet somebody tonight that's going to go to hell, Father, unless somebody shows them. Would you please... Get some of these Christians to quit worrying about who wins the dumb ball game and start worrying about who's going to heaven or hell. Send a revival, please, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's an honor to be here in Jacksonville, Florida tonight. My name's Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15